Hi, Dr. Robin here. In this video, I'm going to introduce you to a great tool that environmental chemists use a lot, an EHPH diagram. EHPH diagrams are used to help us determine what we call the speciation of an element in aqueous solution. What is speciation? Well, most elements don't naturally occur in their pure form in nature. For example, think of iron. You might think of iron as a big lump of metal, but it rarely shows up that way. It might be present as an iron two plus ion or an iron three plus ion or iron three hydroxide, or you get the picture. Whatever form they occur in depends on the nature of their surroundings. And an EHPH diagram is designed to help you see what form an element would take under particular conditions. Here's an EHPH diagram for sulfur, which we're going to look at in more detail later. But for now, I want you to notice a few things. First of all, the x-axis on all EHPH diagrams is pH. You should be pretty familiar with what pH represents, but perhaps you haven't thought about how pH affects the speciation of elements. We'll get around to why that is later. Secondly, the y-axis on all EHPH diagrams is EH, which is a quantity you probably haven't seen before. So what is it? The official answer is that it's the activity of electrons in a system but a lot of people find that definition a little confusing. Another way to explain EH is to think of an acronym people use to talk about it. ORP is the oxidation reduction potential. I personally think this is a lot easier for people to conceptualize. The more electrons available in a system, the more reducing an environment will be. The fewer electrons, the more oxidizing it is. The way the EH scale is set up, the higher the number, the more oxidizing your environment is. The lower the number, the more reducing your environment is. So where would you find oxidizing or reducing conditions? Oxidizing conditions are the easiest to think about. If there's oxygen nearby, that would be oxidizing conditions. A lot of the time, this means the parts of aqueous systems that are close to the surface. By contrast, reducing conditions will be found anywhere that's somehow kept away from oxygen, places near the bottom of deep bodies of water, like deep sea vents or sediments at the bottom of lakes or wetlands. Now, one thing that you saw in the EHPH diagram for sulfur that you will see in every other EHPH diagram is this set of parallel lines. These represent the limits on what you can find in aqueous solution. What does that mean? Well, this top line here represents what happens under extremely oxidizing conditions. The water will actually turn into oxygen gas and you won't have an aqueous solution anymore. Likewise, this lower line represents what will happen under extremely reducing conditions where the water gets reduced to hydrogen gas. So everything in aqueous solution must fall between those two lines. Your EHPH diagram may have information that falls outside of the lines as this EHPH diagram for sulfur does. But all that means is those chemical species can only exist outside of aqueous solution. I'm going to point out a specific example later. What I want to do now is show you a few basic principles of EHPH diagrams. To understand the first, I need to calculate the oxidation numbers for the different sulfur species on this diagram. If you don't remember how to calculate oxidation numbers, pause the video and click on the link to the review video in the description below. I'm going to start with sulfate, SO42 minus. We don't know what the oxidation number of sulfur is, but oxidation numbers tell us that the oxidation of each of the four oxygens will be minus two. So we get a total of minus eight from that. We also know that the sum of the oxidation numbers for the molecule must be equal to the charge on the molecule minus two. So the oxidation number of sulfur has to be something that when added to minus eight gives us minus two and therefore it has to be plus six. You can do a similar calculation for the sulfur in HSO4 minus, and it also gives you a value of plus six. Let's now calculate the oxidation number of sulfur in dihydrogen sulfide. This is a neutral molecule, so the sum of the oxidation numbers must add up to zero. We have two hydrogens, each with a plus one charge, giving a total of plus two. So the oxidation number of the sulfur in this case must be minus two. You can do similar calculations for HS minus and the sulfide anion, and both of these have oxidation numbers of minus two. Let's put this into context by now looking at where all of these oxidation numbers fall on our EHPH diagram. You can see that the species that have a higher oxidation number occur near the top of the EHPH diagram, 
and the numbers that have the smaller number end up at the bottom of the EH-PH diagram. And of course, this makes sense if you think about the fact that the numbers with the higher oxidation number are more oxidized, so they're going to exist in more oxidizing environments. Now let's look at another aspect of this diagram. And to do that, I'm going to focus in on our plus six species. As you cross the vertical line between them, what changes? Going from SO4 to minus to HSO4 minus, you gain an H plus. But if you're going the other direction, you're losing an H plus. Put that into context on the graph. If you move to a more acidic part of the diagram, you gain an H plus, which makes sense because there should be more H plus ions available to react in a more acidic environment. By contract, if you move to a more basic or less acidic environment, there should be fewer H plus ions. So losing an H plus from your species makes a lot of sense. You can see the same sort of pattern if you look at the species with the minus two oxidation numbers, going from H2S to HS minus, which involves moving from left to right on the graph, or acidic to basic, you lose an H plus ion. Going from HS minus to S2 minus, you lose another H plus. Or you could decide to go from right to left, from more basic to more acidic, you start gaining H plus ions. We've spent a lot of time on the EH-PH diagram for sulfur, so it's time to look at a few more. Here's one for calcium. A couple of things I want you to notice. First, calcium is always in the plus two oxidation state, unless it's not aqueous. Calcium in the plus four oxidation state up here is a solid, so it wouldn't occur in aqueous solution. Second, we see a different sort of pH dependence here. Most of the time we see a free calcium ion in solution, but at very basic pHs, we see a calcium hydroxide complex. What's going on here? It's kind of the opposite of the pH H plus dependence that we were seeing before. At more basic pHs, there's more OH minus present. More basic, more H minus, more acidic, less OH minus. I also want to point out that some elements have easier EH pH diagrams than others. All of the alkali metals tend to exist in exactly one oxidation state, plus one. They also don't form complexes or acids, so their EH pH diagrams contain only one species. One of the things that we'll be learning in this class is that element speciation is really dependent on a couple of things. What's around it, what the pH of the system is, and what the oxidation reduction potential of the system is. Understanding these relationships helps us to predict the speciation of an element under a given set of conditions. Keep an eye out for my next EHPH video, which will help you learn how to make one of these diagrams. I hope this was helpful, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. By the way, I want to send out a special thank you to the crew from the Geological Society of Japan who put together the Atlas of EHPH Diagrams. Your book has saved me so much time, not just on this video, but on all of my lectures and homework sets. Thanks again.